So I could look at this in, in several different ways, but uh, maybe focusing on three different topics. Um, one is that probably five, 10 years ago, if we were talking about marketing data, probably most of our conversation would be about attribute data, descriptions of consumers, what are their media preferences, what are their lifestyle actions, what are their demographics, was the primary focus was really on understanding the consumer. So then you could understand how to message to them in a compelling way or where you could find them through uh, different channels. But as that last word that I just used started to expand channels, um, we saw the rise of identity data uh, becoming just as important as attribute data because a marketer could know everything about me. I could present an attractive prospect to them, but if they couldn't connect with me through these new channels of, well, today connected TV, mobile app, the uh, online display, email, all these new digital channels, then their interaction with me would be very limited and they might miss me as a customer. So we started to see that instead of just needing to know where I lived in my street address and maybe my telephone number, all these new identities started to rise. So I'd say that it's been the rise of having this second sort of data becoming just as important um, as understanding who I am, which is how can you connect to me? How can you identify me when you see me uh, in the ad tech ecosystem so then you can advertise me? So that's, that's one development we've seen. Um, a second would be that data in the past was very static um, and it was very offline based, right? So uh, in the US, we would use consumer demographics. We would use survey based data. Uh, we would start to use email marketing data, but it was for the most part uh, data that wouldn't change over time. Uh, and when it would change, it might have sudden shifts because maybe we didn't engage a consumer for six months. And now we've gone back to ask them a survey question and hey, they've had kids or they've moved to a new area or those sorts of things. Where if you fast forward to today, we see that there's an incredible amount of signal data available in the ecosystem, right? As soon as I am outside, all of a sudden, uh, you're starting to track me about what my movements are. Uh, you can start looking at other information then and tie that to it. What's the weather where I'm at in case you wanna offer me something based upon that? Am I entering a polygon that has um, a certain sort of presence for you that then you want to engage me? Um, so it's this recency and frequency of data that's really changed the equation. And there was probably a time during this transition where folks were maybe an uh, paralyzed. They had analysis paralysis where you'd make a decision, you'd be set to go in your campaign and all of a sudden this new information would come in you went back a couple of steps, you got that information back in, and then you started back down the, the road to, to use it in your marketing. Um, so there was this kind of tension and really growth process of understanding how to use the signal data in a way that could benefit your marketing operations, but then not hinder your progress. So that's a, a second area, really, going from this offline static data uh, to this very dynamic um, signal data. And then the third, which we've really seen in the last several years, at least in the US, is we used to be able to use data with regard to industry um, guidelines. So direct, direct Marketing Association, ANA, those sorts of industry guidelines. But we'd have to make sure we're staying within the boundaries of some pretty wide sort of use cases and applications for the data uh, and didn't really have to uh, worry about really some government activism or interference um, in the practices. You know, we had the trust of the consumer. Um, if, if there were things that bad actors did, we made sure that we tried to police that as an industry. What we've seen in the last several years, actually across the world, is governments coming in and saying, well, data has become such an, an important part of not only our economy, but our citizens' lives. And there's a little bit of a dual citizenship now. If I have my offline a citizenship and I have an online presence now and as everyone sees an online digital history that tracks me wherever I go uh, and then can be used to make certain decisions or, or marketing efforts um, towards me. So now we have to consider what are some of the regulations that uh, might govern our data that in the past we didn't have these considerations. I think they're all positive. I'm for more legislation. Um, in the U.S., what I'd like to see, though, is one set of legislation across the U.S., rather than having maybe a California and a Nevada and a Florida develop these regulations. So 
where in the past I could use the data, kind of understand what the industry guidelines were, um, and not really have to worry about changes that were coming down the pike in six months that, whoa, we're going to have to change this campaign to today where there's starting to be this patchwork of regulations where, well, it depends where that consumer is. Can I use their data? Can I store their data? We have to make sure that uh, we have the rights to that data in that jurisdiction, which is a sub part of our market if it's a state. So those are three sorts of developments that I've seen. Um, I'm sure there are others. Um, but throughout my career, these are the ones that I've been most impacted by and been able to work with. So there is a lot of turmoil, right? Especially this spring uh, with Apple's move with ATT and, and Google's announcement and everyone's getting ready or folks aren't really running to get ready. They're going to wait to see what sort of solutions come up. Um, but I think one area that this gives us is an opportunity to reset and to look at our ecosystem and to actually try to maybe proactively address some of the parts of the ecosystem that came along and were developed during the process. But if they would have been considered up front, uh, might have made a much more efficient system. Uh, I mean, we can talk about being able to deliver ads over a browser where as an advertiser, I have no control over a browser. You know, Google does, Apple does, um, you know, if you're using Firefox, some other browsers do. Um, but we have zero control over sort of the delivery mechanism. That's maybe not unique. You saw the same in linear TV. Uh, and actually, you could, you could say that too with, with radio. Um, but this gives us the opportunity to see if we can better work with that ecosystem from the beginning to say, if we're going to deliver through browsers, if we're going to deliver through uh, mobile apps, if we're going to deliver through connected TV, how do we start from the beginning and build a system from scratch, which will help us uh, not only engage these uh, different technologies with those partners who are creating the technologies, but also in a more cohesive manner, um, because we're not adding one uh, over time as we've, we've had to do over the last 10, 15 years. Um, another area with this will help us hopefully address is attribution. Attribution has always been very difficult in digital, um, you know, and understanding the customer journey and doing media mix modeling and then putting the right weights against different uh, customer interactions. Um, but in the end, it's been very difficult to say, well, which was the one sort of engagement that I had, which really triggered that conversion or event that I wanted from that consumer. Uh, and there's hope that we can start building in sort of attribution indicators or uh, the ability to track maybe in a more centralized manner or coordinated manner uh, through a new ecosystem. It's going to require a lot of uh, industry coordination, but I think all of the parties that are working uh, in the market tech and ad tech space want to solve this issue. Um, another area we can address is fraud. Um, there's considerable fraud in the existing system with bot traffic, with you know fake ad inventory, you know, really a lack of transparency. And we have the opportunity here to do a reset in that area too, and start to put in safeguards and protections and agreements uh, that try to limit that. I don't think we're ever gonna get rid of it um, entirely. Fraudsters are always exist, unfortunately, I believe, uh, but we can at least address some of the more common areas and hopefully cut down on the significant amount of fraud. Uh, that marketers are faced to having to deal with. So then we can also build privacy first into a new sort of ecosystem that we've got, where in the past we created an ecosystem that was, as I said previously, fairly open-ended. Um, and we had to start building in privacy controls as they became part of our experience. Well, today we have the opportunity to identify what some of those existing requirements are from a privacy perspective and keep the system open-ended enough that as new sorts of regulations and guidelines come into play, we're able to evolve the system in an efficient manner where we don't add additional unnecessary costs, but we minimize the impact of these uh, regulatory considerations into our daily operations. Uh, and really the, the last two pieces I'll say are all around really what I've already talked about. We can make a much more efficient system uh, because we can build it from what we have already experienced in the past, knowing the levels of maturity we had to reach and bake that into a new system so we don't make some of the mistakes of the past, um, which includes making sure identity is part of that system, 
you know, as I said earlier, identity kind of came along next to at attributes and describing consumers. Well, now we know identity is a critical part of our uh, ability to engage consumers where they want to be engaged. So we can build that in as a foundational piece of the system. So I'm a data guy from, uh, from the beginning. That's part of my heart, part of my whole career. I've, I've always loved working with data and I've always tried to see if we can get more efficient data, more accurate data, uh, data that has more lasting value uh, and always question data uh, because I believe that your data uh, will put a limit on your ability to perform. If you're using great data, then you have the skies open. You have the ability to create excellent results and you can get the returns you want. But if you start with data that's spotty, if you start with it, maybe it doesn't have the high quality that you could have with it, um, if it's got dirtiness in it, um, you begin to really impact your potential level of performance. So any downstream use of that data is going to have an artificial governor on the performance. You're going to have a ceiling um, just because you're not using um, sort of the best ingredients you can in your operations. Uh, so I've been surprised that there hasn't been as much an emphasis on data maturity and data quality um, through the development of the, the current ad tech system. Uh, you know, I was part of some IAB efforts to put a certification together uh, around uh, data. Uh, the IAB has put out data transparency guidelines for uh, digital audience segments um, with somewhat low adoption. It's maybe still early, um, but I would hope that as we would move forward and create this new system, that's an area that we address, that we start to understand that there is a difference between different audiences. If I uh, want to buy um, an auto and tender audience, that I can begin to understand what is the underlying data that's telling me that these folks are interested in buying an automobile. Uh, and I can maybe do a calculation saying mm, cheapest isn't always the best because it might limit my cost, but my ROI, especially if I'm able to do that attribution uh, where we can identify that, um, is going to be lower. And so if I want to be able to increase my ROI overall, maybe I'll make a little bit more of a investment in the data I'm using because I know it's going to pay off two to three times when I actually start to use it. So data maturity is the one area where every year I look in the ecosystem and I hope this is the year. Um, now, I'd say right now there are lots of challenges right, that we're faced with. Identity is number one. Uh, so I don't expect there to be a spotlight on uh, maybe looking at the attribute data and seeing how we can improve our operations around there, because I think we first have to um, understand what's going to be the state of identity moving forward after uh, these browser changes and mobile ad IDs go away. When I look at news sources uh, that I get exposed to, it's difficult to find one that is neutral. Um, that isn't telling me um, a narrative that maybe uh, a conservative opinion wants to um, profess or um, the other side, a liberal uh, sort of view, viewpoint of the news. Um, and I found a couple of sources. One that I, I like and I find very intriguing is called The Flip Side um, because it'll look at an issue that's uh, currently uh, in, in the news and they'll go to the sources that are on one side and sources are on another or uh, sort of opinion writers on both sides uh, and present their arguments. So you can look at the issue, you can understand um, the arguments for, um, for one side saying this is a positive development or we have concerns about it. Um, and then you can see um, uh, arguments on the other side. And I don't want to discount the fact that presenting your opinion is not important. Um, and some of the, the reasoning that goes behind the opinions is very well structured. But I enjoy being able to see both sides of the issue and then making my own decision. Uh, the flip side will also, when it's possible, try to provide a neutral opinion. They'll a lot of times identify it as libertarian, but a neutral opinion too. Um, so then after I've read that, I feel like I'm better educated on maybe trying to identify what's real and maybe what's rhetoric um, that I'm exposed to um, in headlines. And there have been several times in the past where I've read a headline and I've started to react a certain way. Then the flip side has come in and I've read it and I was like, oh, well, they didn't mention these three other 
uh, bits of information that would have changed my opinion. Um, so just, I appreciate journalism and I appreciate the opportunity then to understand all sides of the issue through the flip side.